Welcome to another IBSA online meeting. I'm delighted to be joined today with Ed, uh, Jimmy Sexton of the Esquire Group and Ed Stone of the US and UK lawyers, Womble Bond Dickinson. Uh, they'll be discussing the thorny issue of how to maintain privacy for international clients and their business holding structures in an era of increasingly transparent and potentially dangerous disclosure requirements. Uh, we won't be discussing shady issues, but the legitimate reasons for clients wanting to keep their financial affairs private and the consequent uses of US and onshore trusts for such purpose. Uh, for those new to the IBSA online meetings, we've got regular meetings, I say this every week, at 3 p.m. UK time every Tuesday, and uh, hence the name of our Tuesday Club meetings. We keep these meetings to 30 minutes of bite-sized nuggets of information on a variety of topics. And because the IBSA comprises entrepreneurs and their professional advisors, these topics range from intellectual property, finance, law, tax, and all aspects of international business structuring. We record these sessions and they're exclusively available to our members on our website, uh, but we do open the uh, online discussions for non-members as well. Uh, if you'd like to know more about our not-for-profit association, the International Business Structuring Association, please contact me at info at the uh, And a final reminder about muting. Please keep your um, computers muted uh, so we don't hear the dogs and children in the background since you're probably working from home at the time. Uh, so without further ado, let me pass you over to Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Sexton, to introduce the session. Jimmy. Yeah, my name is Jimmy Sexton, uh, founder and CEO of Esquire Group. And as Roy said today, we're going to be talking uh, about how to uh, achieve privacy in structuring your client's business affairs in today's uh, transparency world. Um, you know, I think through government propaganda and, and through propaganda of you know, non-governmental associations like the OECD and the Tax Justice Network, privacy has somewhat become uh, synonymous with, with shady. Um, and, you know, like governments kind of try to argue if, you have, if you're doing nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide. Uh, and I think that that is very dangerous for a couple reasons. I think one, there are some legitimate reasons, which I'll discuss in a minute, for why people would want to, to keep their, um, legitimately want to keep their, their uh, financial affairs private. And secondly, all this transparency assumes that governments always act in good faith, uh, which I think we all know that they don't. Um, and so I think, I think privacy is, is something that's, that's quite important. Um, you know, sp specifically when we're talking about ultra high net worth clients uh, and, and their business affairs, I mean, some of the, the situations that I come across quite a bit um, in terms of, of legitimate reasons why they need to keep their, or, or it's desirable for them to keep their financial affairs private are one, to protect their families from, from extortion and kidnapping. I, I mean, I had a client whose driver tried to kidnap him in, in Mexico, for example. Um, to keep, their, their, keep themselves and their families from becoming targets of fraud and, and frivolous lawsuits, to protect their wealth from uh, potential spouses or their heirs' potential spouses or actual spouses. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's also important to shield the extent of your wealth from your family. I mean, there's, there's a lot of cases where families, very wealthy families, want the kids to grow up a relatively normal uh, and they don't want the kids to know the extent of their wealth. They don't want, you know, the parents of their kids' friends knowing the extent of their wealth. Sometimes they don't even want their own brothers and sisters knowing the extent of, of, of their wealth. Uh, uh, well, maybe I can just nip in there. Sure. I, uh, hello, everybody. I'm Ed, Ed Stone of One World Dickinson. And I think that the point that Jimmy just made is, is, is very true. And I've, I've seen it firsthand how a, a family's life was turned upside down when public beneficial ownership records came in and all their neighbors in their small quiet town could see actually they were the, one of the largest shareholders, one of the largest companies in, in that country. And they had to install security walls, cameras, the children had to change schools. And it had a very huge impact on their lives, which information that these people didn't, didn't need to know. Um, I think also we, we, we give away a lot of information um, and more and more to, to, to governments which we're forced to give. But also, I think coming out of COVID, we, we, we've seen, you know, people with apps that track your movements and, and everything. 
And as Jimmy says, you know, what will government do with all this information? Um, I think we need to, to sort of keep an eye on it to make sure that governments are using information to, to protect us. Um, but there is no guarantee that the data, whether it's on ethnic backgrounds, religion or anything else, could be used by some government for some other purpose. And I think also working from home on more sort of security issue on the privacy side, you know, there is an increased vulnerability um, because working from home, we, we use our personal devices more often. We use networks and platforms. Um, Zoom is, is not always approved of by, by certain, certain firms and, and, and banks because it's, so it's supposedly less secure, maybe not. Um, there was a long discussion about BlackBerry and, and, and iPhones. So I always thought well, that's more commercial than anything else. But we are definitely using networks and platforms that, that may not be as secure as others. And, and that um, can lead to increased risk of, of business information being, being accessed by other people um, un, unintentionally. Mm. And I think also, Jimmy mentioned the, the risk of, of kidnapping. And I think in, in, in Europe, especially, we, we probably tend to underplay this and underestimate it and think, oh, this, this doesn't happen. Um, but it, it, it does happen. Um, and I think in, in, in Europe, perhaps that the focus is, is more on information that, that, that governments are collecting. And we've now got the, the latest and the sixth incarnation of DAC6, the Directive on Administrative Cooperation in the field of taxation, which is coming in. And that has pernicious effects on the transparency which affects, affect families. Um, the governments are collecting more and more information. Um, and a lot of that is publicly available. Um, and how, how are governments using this information? Certainly in, in the UK, HMRC are exploiting the information that they are they're receiving. Um, they've expanded their toolkit. They are apparently the only government agency with a computer system that works, um, but they are capable of analyzing this data and they are sending out more and more demands and requests for information based on the data they received for the automatic exchange information coming from other, other tax authorities. And some of that information may not necessarily be, be correct. It may be information about a protector of a trust. Um, and suddenly they think, oh, he's got 10 million or whatever it is here, doesn't correspond to his tax return. Let's ask a question. He's then got to go to his accountants, go to his lawyers and, and, and go through the whole process. So a lot of claims that have, 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 have are coming out of the HMRC based on what they received are spurious and causing an awful lot of time and expense to be wasted. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of similar cases where, you know, there's been, been somebody who's been a director on a, on a company uh, outside of, of their home jurisdiction and they sign on a bank account. They have no ownership in, in that company, but because of, of the CRS automatic data exchange, because of beneficial owner registers, all of a sudden they have their home um, country tax authority auditing them and, 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 and looking as if they're doing something wrong and have all this money overseas, which, which they don't. Um, and I think there's another very practical uh, business reason for keeping information private, which is negotiating business deals. If the person you're negotiating with knows you have a bunch of money, you're not going to get as good of a, a deal. And an example that I like to, to make is, you know, I, I grew up in California and, and um, you know, Disneyland is one of the biggest um, uh, owners of land in, in Southern California. And when they decided to expand the park, they went around buying up hotels nearby and people weren't set willing to sell for reasonable prices. They wanted ridiculous inflated prices. And so they were able to form an LLC at that time, uh, which, you know, doesn't list the, the shareholder uh, or, or the managers. And then they could go around and buy it up because nobody knew how was it behind it. Uh, and, you know, certainly with, with public beneficial owner registers, doing something like that becomes uh, a, a lot more difficult. And so uh, I kind of what prompted my, my, my interest in a lot of this was I, I recently had a, 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 a client approach me and said, listen, I want a private confidential solution. For trust. <laughs> what jurisdiction is left where there's not going to be CRS, where there's not going to be these public beneficial owner registers, where I don't have to register my trustee. And so I started giving it some thought and, and I came up with a very unlikely candidate, which is the United States, uh, which, you know, often is not thought of as, as a tax haven uh, other than Delaware, maybe. Um, but the U.S. has some very interesting laws that allow you to set up a U.S. trust, but to treat that trust as a foreign trust for U.S. tax purposes. 
So as long as that trust doesn't have um, any U.S. income, the trust wouldn't have any U.S. tax filing obligations. It wouldn't have any U.S. Uh, uh, taxes to pay. And I think that, that this is this is very beneficial because the U.S. Does, is not a signatory to CRS. That there's no uh, public or private beneficial owner registers. Uh, the, the trust documents are completely private, so they're not registered anywhere. Even if, if somebody tried to get it, they couldn't. Uh, they also have relatively easy banking uh, in terms of getting bank accounts compared to the rest of the world. The setup costs are, are, are I think, pretty reasonable compared to a lot of the offshore jurisdiction. Uh, many of the U.S. states have drafted specific asset protection trust statutes, which are very, very robust, many of them. Um, they also, in certain states, allow for private trust companies. So if it's an ultra high net worth family that doesn't want to turn um, their assets over to a, a professional trust company, they can form a, a PTC. And the U.S. is also generally a white listed uh, jurisdiction when doing international business transactions. I mean, it's very rare that you have a bank question a financial transaction with the U.S. between a, you know, a U.S. bank and a European bank or, or, or a Middle Eastern bank. So I think that, that um, the U.S. Uh, really has a lot to offer compared to the traditional jurisdictions where um, one would go to set up a trust. Yeah, um, I, that, that's great. Um, and you're, you're, you're lucky there with the, with, with the states. I would just, just caution though, I mean, I know you, you, you said that there's no income tax if you have, have no US income, but if, if someone's thinking of moving assets into a structure and sort of a holding element in the states, then there may still be reporting under intergovernmental agreements with the US and also under um, CRS at, at, and the, you would, you, know, you can't avoid CRS. And, and one of the things that comes out of DAC 6 is that if you are involved in a scheme which is designed to avoid reporting on a CRS, that is reportable. So if it's a European client involved in assets moving to the States, um, be careful. But certainly we, we, we've seen, I think, you know, a growth in, in, in trust um, companies and trust experience in, in, in the US. And I think that, that, that's, that's great. And it's, 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 they're, but there are many reasons why you'd want to choose, you know, why, well, many reasons why you would choose a particular jurisdiction. And obviously privacy vis-a-vis um, -vis, you know, um, government authorities and trying to limit and control the amount of information that is, that is going out outside without your control is one thing. But another area that you might want to consider, and it would be interesting to hear how, how the protection is in the US, but sort of privacy against your own family in a, in a way controlling the information which your family can get hold of. Um, and I think the offshore jurisdictions have been very good at um, adapting to that and, and restricting the information. Um, so, for example, in Cayman under a Star Trust or in Guernsey under a foundation, the beneficiaries have no right to information um, within the, the trust structure. Um, and there's an enforcer who has to be appointed, who can enforce the trust and make sure the trustees do actually do what they're supposed to be doing with, with those assets. Um, and that can stop a lot of family arguments. And we, I've, I've said I've seen families, and it's uh, the case of the re A and B trusts in, in Jersey, and there are about six, six cases have been reported on that same trust. And they, the family there, the, the, the children, um, seem to believe that a pound in the hand is worth four in the trust and they want to get hold of that, that one pound. Um, the interesting in the letter of wishes, the father said, don't tell my children about this trust because, because if they find out there will be chaos. And when they did find out after his death, that there has been chaos. Um, so I think the offshore jurisdictions can, can be useful for that, um, for limiting the information that, we, that, we, that the trustees have to divulge to, to the beneficiaries. And also they perhaps be more innovative. I mean, you, you said to me that the private trust companies are available in, in states, but do you have sort of non-charitable non purpose trusts? Um, are there foundations in the, in the states? Um, yeah, so I mean, there's, there's a couple, there's a couple of, of states now that have enacted uh, foundation laws, you know, civil law foundations. New Hampshire was the first. Um, Wyoming is now the, the second. Arguably, Wyoming's law is quite a bit stronger on this. Um, 
And I think that that's, you know, I, I spoke with somebody from the, the law firm that helped draft the statute. And, you know, they said that they designed this uh, foundation law specifically for foreign clients, for non-resident aliens. Um, I think what gets a little bit tricky with foundations, I mean, Wyoming wrote a very nice foundation law. I think it's, it's, it's very good. It's very robust. I think one of the issues, though, is that because the U.S. does not have a, uh, a, a foundation as, as in, in the, defined in the tax code, there's an ambiguity as to how it's taxed. And it's basically up to the tax professional to review it and say, okay, this looks more like a trust, we should tax it like a trust, or this looks more like a company, we should tax it like a corporation. And this can become quite dangerous uh, because you know, if you set up a trust, if it were a, a trust with a foreign grantor, for example, that didn't have any US income, it would have no filing requirements in, in, in the US and no income tax. Whereas if it was treated like a corporation, it would have a tax filing it would be a taxable entity in the U.S. and then have to file a tax return. Um, what we've done in the past when we've drafted foundations, foreign foundations that you know, U.S. clients, for example, wanted to have treated as grant or trust, you know, we've just made sure that in the foundations governing documents that we've written in there that, you know, uh, that we intend it to be treated as a grant or trust under the U.S. tax laws and try to do everything we could um, to try to, to solidify that. But, you know, of course, that's no guarantee to, to an IRS challenge. So I think that is a danger with the US and foundations. I think that in, in the UK, we, we've seen the same with HMRC, um, certainly in, in the past, um, looking at foundations, especially the Liechtenstein foundations and, and saying, oh, well, you know, well, if we treat this as a company, we get more tax, so they go down yeah. that route. So it tends to be the tax authorities look where they can get the most, the most revenue. But I think foundations certainly are, are, are growing in, in, in popularity. I think one of their yeah. advantages is they are an, they're an orphaned vehicle. Yeah. Um, and that does make them attractive. And, and they, they also exist. So for yeah. the clients thinking of trust, and I've seen many, many clients you know that one of the questions they ask, even if they're familiar with trust, is you know, what, what stops the trustee running off with my money? Yep. Um, and the answer to that is, well, they're, they're in a good, well-regulated jurisdiction, um, and they want to remain in business, so they're, they're, they won't. But I think foundations, a lot of people, there, there is that, that ease that you're not handing over your assets to somebody yep. else. And also they've got legal existence. They've got a birth certificate, a certificate of incorporation, which can be useful for buying property or something. You know, it does help in, in, in that process too. So I think that we're seeing more of that. So maybe the IRS and HMRC will get more familiar with, with, with foundations. Yeah, and I mean, one thing I would add to that, you know, a lot of, so I, I live in Dubai and I work with a lot of, of, of Middle Eastern clients. And um, because of, of the Sharia law, trusts don't really have much effect for them. They're generally disregarded, uh, whereas foundations are, are not. Uh, they're treated like companies, and so they're able to do estate planning and, and, and wealth preservation through foundations as opposed to trusts. Uh, so I think that, that uh, you know, foundations for, for a lot of people, as, as you said, are, are becoming more popular and, and uh, have a lot of applicability. And I think one other area that sort of the offshore jurisdictions have done well recently is, is their, their firewalls. Um, Bermuda is the latest to, to um, change its firewall to prevent trusts under, within their jurisdiction being attacked or very yeah. interfered with by, by foreign courts. And that's particularly important perhaps in, in the area of divorce. So if someone yeah. is looking for divorce protection, they will want a, a robust firewall. Um, are the, the states going up in the, any states got good firewall legislation? Um, I think I think the only state that I would really say has has a, a, a decent firewall is Nevada. Um, so you know they don't have like most foreign jurisdictions don't recognize foreign judgments. Um, the United States uh, you know generally does recognize foreign judgments. I mean there's a couple of states that have statutes that say if the foreign country doesn't recognize U.S. judgments, we won't recognize their judgments, for example. Um, but it is much easier to get a foreign judgment, uh, uh, you know, enforced in, in the United States. Uh, Nevada has something called, uh, a, where you can say that there's uh, exception creditors, what they define as exception creditors, have no access to the trust. So an exception creditor, for example, would be a spouse, you know, that might be entitled to something. Um, and so Nevada does, does give a firewall in, in that respect. There's 
absolutely no carve outs for who can ask, access the trusts. Uh, but they're the only state that I'm aware of that, that have that. Guys, you, you, you uh, mentioned about uh, judgments just now. Um, yeah. I was sent an email just four hours ago. Apparently the ECJ uh, issued a judgment today in a case brought by Privacy International uh, that the collection of bulk communication data by the UK's security and intelligence agencies from mobile network operators for the purposes of combating crime is invalid, which is interesting. And the US wow. courts also have held in a FATCA related case that there is no legitimate expectation of privacy in banking information such as wow. FATCA and so on. So wow. I just want to ask both of you, do you think the pendulum has reached a point where it has to swing back a little in favor of privacy for the individual? I, I, I would hope so. But I think that once governments have got information and access to information, they are very reluctant to, to give it up and they'll find other ways of, of, of getting it, I think. Um, so I'm sort of a pessimist, I think, on, on, on that side. I think there are, there are huge arguments in, in about data protection, the overlap between data protection and, and, and privacy and disclosure. Um, I think that does need to be explored. Um, Maybe I, because I sit in the UK, I have, I have more faith in, in our government. Um, and I think if, if I was elsewhere, yes, I would be very worried. Uh, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with that. I'm a bit of pessimist on, on, this, on, on this particular topic. I think data collection and transparency, and I, I think data collection in general is just going to grow. Uh, what, I think is, what I think potentially is going to happen, though, is that at some point there's going to be so much data that mining it is going to be impracticable uh, because a lot of these systems are not integrated, right? Like beneficial owner registers with CRS data and, and, and all of this stuff. I mean, at some point, they'll probably be able to get that. But I think that there's a lot of separate data sources um, and, and comparing those and trying to make sense of it uh, is, is, is a challenge for governments. I mean, I think, I think the U.S. is a great example. I mean, the FATCA data has basically just gone into a black hole. I mean, there hasn't been one real FATCA related case or, or, or anything with all of this data that's been collected. That's very interesting. Actually, Ed said something just before um, that uh, HMRC, despite the information overload, seemed to have got the systems uh, in place oh. to be able to assimilate that and, and to, to, to make uh, uh, inquiries as a result of that. Ed, is, that's a good comment you made. It's an interesting one. It is, uh, uh, but I think also, it seems that HMRC is sort of under-resourced at the moment. So they're sort of re receiving data and then they're sending out letters to asking people to, you know, to self-correct and say, you know, please confirm that you've got no offshore income or your tax return is correct, but not actually going much further than that. So I think there, there is, as Jimmy says, they're awash with data. Um, so perhaps, you know, the, 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 that, that's a good thing um, in the sense that it takes harder for them to find it. but. One's got to then trust that it's not going to leak out, and that no one else is going to access it. It's a big fear. And, and Ed, you mentioned uh, DAC6, uh, which is, of course, an EU project um, for transparency and so on. And uh, we, we, we've talked about that already in previous uh, sessions. Um, how is uh, Brexit going to affect that? Uh, will it continue to have an impact in the UK post-Brexit? Post Yes, so it's a good example of HMRC not being willing to, to give up powers that they've got. So DAC 6 is a European directive. Perhaps you know, it should fall away when we, when we leave Europe. But no, they've made perfectly clear that we're, we're going to continue to apply it and it's been transposed into UK law and that's going to carry on. So the reporting requirements, although they've been put back six months, they do start in the end of February next year um, for, for structures that were set up between was it June 2018 and July 2020. So that, that's coming in and we're going to have to report. I think it, it's not, what's not so clear is how they're going to exchange information. Um, and I think the, 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 we go back to the old problem that the, of, of um, national tax authorities only wanting to, being able to collect their own tax and, and, and wanting information so they can collect their tax. They're not always so keen on uh, giving information to other people to, to collect their taxes. It's not their priority. Um, but they will swap it to, to, to trade to get information. Um, so it's, it's, it's in, it's coming in, it'll become part of UK legislation. So there'll be very, very little change um, there. 
And uh, I, I mean, I don't know whether Jimmy or you want to talk about this. The, the, the US, if you wanted to create a foundation, would you create, you, you mentioned two states that had foundations in the US. Um, tell me, Jimmy, you can answer this. For an NLC, you mentioned that a trust with no US income and uh, no US grantor uh, would uh, not have to file US tax returns. <coughs> I know in the past, I've used this actually, an LLC with no US income whatsoever also yep. didn't have to file US tax returns. Is that the same now? Uh, that is the same now. So if you have a, a, a US LLC, it does not have to file a US income tax return, but they have imposed some reporting requirements on US LLCs. And there's two specifically. So one, an LLC is required to file an FBAR, which is this report of foreign bank and financial accounts. So if the LLC has a foreign bank account, uh, you would need to file an FBAR uh, and, and report that to, to the Treasury. The other one, which is a newer requirement, is a requirement to file a Form 5472, which is basically a uh, disclosure of the ultimate beneficial owner of the LLC. Um, so you have to disclose the direct and, and indirect ultimate owner of, of the LLC to the IRS. Uh, and you also have to disclose any transactions between the LLC and a related party. Um, and, and not just a related party to an LLC, but a, but a related party to its ultimate uh, owner. Um, there's no, no tax on the LLC on, on any of those transactions, but it does need to be disclosed uh, and to the IRS. In your scenario of a U.S. trust, uh, let's say owning a U.S. LLC, uh, where you don't have a, um, a named person as the beneficiary, let's right. say, uh, you would wind up listing the trust. Uh, so, if in, in the U.S. distinguishes between simple trusts and complex trusts, uh, simple trusts are usually like grantor trusts, where you would look through and, and, and attribute everything to the grantor whereas complex trusts are, are almost treated like independent entities to a certain, certain degree, even though they're, they're not technically an entity. So if you had a lot of beneficiaries, for example, uh, that could be a complex trust, and you just list the name of the trustees then? So I think it would depend. I think this gets a little complex, and it, it depends on um, how the trust is written. I think if, if the beneficiaries, for example, are allocated a fixed percentage, I would say that you would need to list them as the owners. Yes. Uh, but I would say if it's a fully discretionary trust, for example, uh, then it would be the trustee, that would be the trust itself. Okay. I mean, Ed, that sounds uh, a, a pretty good um, privacy protection mechanism, that a U.S. complex trust with a, with a U.S. LLC. Yes, I, and I agree. I think that the U.S. does have advantages for, for, for privacy. I think, I think it's good. I think one's also got to always bear in mind though, where you're coming from, because you have your own local rules. Um, which may still apply to you, so and, and the tax treatment that are given locally. So that's always going to be borne in mind. Um, but I think the U.S. can be a good solution. And the other, I suppose, the other thing, final thing, I suppose, you want to take into account is proximity. If you can't actually speak to your your service provider, whether that's trustee or, or corporate service provider, because they're in a totally different time zone, you're not going to get good communication, and and that's not going to help with the administration of the structure. I think so. Um, I think it, it can work for, for a lot of people. I think it's, it's, it's a great solution. I think it is. And we are certainly, you know, with, with our US arm, we're, we're seeing more and more um, interest in, in US trusts. Very interesting. All right. Well, <laughs> thanks very much indeed. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you, uh, Jimmy and Ed, for joining me in what's been really an illuminating discussion. Uh, very interesting. And if anybody joined late, and I saw quite a few people joined late, and uh, would like to watch this again in its entirety, uh, you can uh, visit our website, uh, theibsa.org forward slash events forward slash videos. Uh, and if you'd like to become members of the IBSA and uh, suitably qualified, and I'm glad to say that we have had quite a lot of new members despite not being uh, able to have physical meetings at the moment, uh, and you wish to attend online meetings, um, but of course, the physical meetings when we eventually have them, which includes workshops and conferences, uh, then please contact uh, us at info at the IBSA.org. Um, okay, so now our next meeting will be next Tuesday again, 13th of October, 
uh, where David Tabukost and uh, Tim von Santen of the Corpac Group will join with Jan Merzak of uh, MHQ in Dubai. And they are going to discuss how corporate service providers have had to reinvent their business model. Corporate service providers have been servicing corporate and private clients with their international structuring needs for decades. But with the need to provide substance now for these companies, uh, the tightening of uh, anti-money laundering regulations, international reporting requirements and the drive towards transparency, such as the DAC6 uh, that we heard Ed talk about um, and beneficial ownership, uh, corporate service providers have had to consider alternative services that they need to offer. So David, Tim and Jan will review some of these services they can offer, including HR services, accounting, uh, KYC client onboarding, corporate governance and many others. So I do hope you're going to be able to join me next week. Uh, and um, again, thank you, uh, Jimmy um, and Ed. And until three o'clock next week, UK time. Goodbye. <laughs>